All right, so the reading today is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through to chapter 2, verse 3. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for, fo- I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. All right. Thanks, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. Forgot my clicker. Uh, A slide's going to come up on the screen any second, I hope. There we go. Something appearing on the screen behind me. It'll just... Yeah, that's it. There it is. Okay, terrific. All right, now, that helps me a little bit, that slide, because I wonder, uh, have you ever pondered just how small we are in this vast universe, this vast, vast universe? Have you ever wondered, what's our place in all this? Who are we? Why are we here? I mean, these are huge questions, aren't they? They're questions, though, that God, our creator, answers for us in the book of Genesis. Now, last week, we focused, um, we focused on the section of Genesis 1 preceding today's reading. Today, we'll start by zooming in on verses 26 and 27, where we learn that on day 6... God made humankind. God made humankind. See, while plants were made according to their kinds, fish according to their kinds, birds according to their kinds, and animals according to their kinds, in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, God alone's the maker and the master, the creator, and the king of everyone and everything. But humans, humans are also alone in that we alone are made in God's image. In the image of God, he made us. But what does that mean? What does that mean? 
Well, kind of like how in the ancient world, statues of kings were made throughout their kingdoms to represent their rule, or, or coins were stamped with their image to represent their rule, like King Charles on our newest coins, so that when you look at the statue or the coin, you see a representation of the ruler. When you look at humans, you see a representation of God himself. Because we've been made to represent God in the world, to mirror and reflect and resemble him. So, who are we? We're image bearers of God himself. And what's our place? Well, our place, it's to represent God and to rule over God's creation on God's behalf under him. It's just so important, you see, for us to know our place, to know our place. In fact, the word from which we get the word human, it comes from the same derivative as, the, as the same Latin derivative, I should say, as the word humility. Humility. The key to being a good human is to be humble. And humility is all about knowing our place. Knowing our place. Because we can either think too highly of ourselves, thinking that we can rule the world without God and save ourselves as if we're gods, right? Which we're not. Okay, that, that, that's wrong thinking. To think that we can rule the world without God and save ourselves as if we're gods, that's wrong. Or we can view ourselves too lowly, living as slaves to our own base instincts and appetites as though we're mere animals, which again is wrong. Friends, we're not gods and we're not animals. We're people. We're people made in the image of God. And so we need to know our place. Our place being under God and over the rest of creation as God's image bearers. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now being God's image bearers, it's not about how we look. It's about how we relate and about the role we play. Firstly, how we relate. Well, as God's image bearers, we are made for relationship. We're made for relationship. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are one God, one God in three persons in perfect relationship. As we humans live life together and, and love each other as we serve and care for one another, although we do this imperfectly, at least in some way, we're showing a likeness of God. Secondly, our role to rule the earth. From verse 27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Some observations. First, men and women are made equally in God's image. They're both given the responsibility for ruling the earth as co-rulers under God's rule. Um, some differences between men and women will come up next week in Genesis chapter 2. Second, part of ruling and subduing is to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. Okay? I personally think I've done my bit. 
<laughs> now, subduing the world, it involves caring for it, caring for it, not destroying it, but also not worshipping it, but working it and looking after it, ruling it not as we please, but in ways that please God. See, God's given us a job, a cultural mandate to, to have children if we can and to spread across the earth, to explore and create and harness God's good creation through philosophy and science and technology and agriculture and the arts and so forth, to explore and to subdue because that's what we were made to do, to make culture, a culture that glorifies God Culture being all the stuff of life, our food and clothing and housing, our family and education and work, our music and entertainment, our arts and sciences and politics and so on and so forth. It's how we think, it's what we do, it's where and how we spend our time, our money, our energy. To, but you see, to build a culture that glorifies God, to to subdue the earth and rule it well, we need to know our place. Not chasing our addictions and compulsions like, like animals, nor living proudly as though we're gods, but instead using the abilities and opportunities that God provides to build a counterculture, a kingdom culture, ruled by King Jesus. So that when we gather as Christians like this, we're not just coming to church. We're not just coming to church. We're creating a kingdom counterculture. So that in our everyday lives, in our marriages, you know, our children, our families, our friendships, our work, our finances, our hobbies, our habits, they're all to reflect God's image and likeness as we represent God in this world. And so what that means is everything you do is sacred. Whether you're an IT specialist, uh, you know, whether you're a cook or a lawyer or, or a person who wears a tool belt or a volunteer or a busy mum, Everything you do, whatever you do, everything you do contributes to this great task of kingdom culture making. Verse 29, God, then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And so here's our diet, okay, initially fruit and veggies. Now don't worry, don't worry, we get meat too. A little bit later we get meat too in Genesis chapter 9. The point here simply being, God creates a world that it sustains us and nourishes us so that we can work hard and work well and create a culture glorifying to him. Verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Everything was very good. Then from chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And I don't know about you, but I mean, don't you just love that? I love that, that God finished the work he'd been doing. God finishes his work. God finishes his work, which he always does. And what we see here is a perfect paradise where God rules and there is rest 
and where all things are blessed. But as we know, unfortunately, it didn't stay that way. Because in Genesis 3, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks, people rejected God's rule and tried to rule themselves without him. The result, they became restless rebels under curse. And that's our experience, isn't it? That's our experience. Because after the fall, although we're still made to bear God's image, sin has disfigured our image and likeness to God, almost beyond recognition. So in reflecting God's image, we're like broken mirrors. We're dysfunctional and disobedient rulers. We're still here to to fill the earth, subdue it and rule it under God, but we don't do a great job. I mean, you only need to look around at the godless cultures that abound to see the kind of rulers we are. But, but, the great news is, the great news is, God's plan all along has been to bring restoration and recreation with God again ruling over God's people in God's place where there is rest and where all things are blessed. But how, how does God achieve this? Well, by coming into human history himself as the second Adam in the person of Jesus. So that what the first Adam lost through his rebellion, Jesus, the second Adam, regained for us through his perfect obedience and sacrifice. The New Testament declares that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And in Jesus, God is recreating and renewing a people into his image and likeness. And so the call of the gospel, it's a call to repent of self-rule and to submit to Jesus' rule. It's a call to be truly human. And so to recover the image of God that we were originally created to bear. Do you see? See, although we live in a secular culture where people join all kinds of recovery groups, don't they? In trying to deal with sin. What are people trying to recover? Their lives before their addictions? Lives that still weren't connected to God? That's not enough, is it? It's not enough. As Christians, we know that real recovery is about recovering the image and likeness of God. Which can only happen when we turn to Jesus and trust in him to take away our sin, to take away our sin and to restore us to his image and likeness. And so if you're not a Christian... If you're not a Christian, there's only one thing to do. Turn to Jesus and trust in him. And if you are a Christian, take great comfort, as I do, in the fact that as the seventh day of creation reminds us, God always finishes his work. When Jesus died, And just before Jesus died on the cross, he said something very important from the cross. What did Jesus declare? It is finished. See, God finished his work of creation. Then we sinned. Then Jesus came and finished his work of redemption. It is finished finished which means there's nothing left for you and me to do to be saved there's nothing for you and me to to do to be saved other than to hand our sin over to Jesus and receive from him forgiveness and then then and then then God's spirit begins his work of changing us 
from being like Adam to being like Jesus, of recreating us into the image of God as we're conformed to the likeness of Jesus. We need to cooperate with him, of course. We need to cooperate with him, of course, submitting to Jesus' rule, being led by God's spirit in our thoughts, our words, our actions. But the job he starts now, he will finish. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. For when Jesus appears, we shall be like him. You see, if we trust in him. So brothers and sisters in Christ, despite how you may feel today, despite how the world around us may appear today, be encouraged, for God is working. And in the end, when his work is done, he'll once again declare it to be very good, including you and me, if we trust in Jesus. In the meantime, he's brought us all here at this time and in this place to know our place, to know our place, that we're not God's masters of our own destinies, And we're not animals, slaves to our own desires. We're God's image bearers to represent him and to rule over his creation under his rule. To build a culture that honours him and to invite non-Christians to come and see that God is good. And to know that when God's work is done, everyone who trusts in God's son, Jesus, will again be in paradise where there is rest and where all things are blessed. Amen.